there are nine tribes, or maybe 14 or maybe 42 some dialects or languages in the Formosan language, it's impossible for me to cover all of them. So I think uh, what I want to do is just to single out some of the interesting aspects. For example, numbers in these Formosan languages are very interesting, maybe different from what you have thought of, or maybe you have never expected numbers could be expressed that way. And this reading is taken from Dr. Lee, the one that I told you. He is now an academician in Academia Sinica, and he has devoted all his life, I mean, he's still working on that, uh, on different tribes, including the mountain, uh, the, the aborigines on the mountain, on high mountain, and also the plant tribes, you know. So he has dedicated all his life, more than 60 years, in working on these languages. That's why he is able to talk about uh, Formosan languages across the board. And he's, I, I think, as far as I know, he's the one nowadays that is really capable of doing this. Okay, so the Formosan languages are extremely diverse at linguistic levels because there are so many tribes. And as we have said, that these nine main tribes can be divided into three major groups. And in terms of uh, languages, they have very different manifestation. And this great diversity indicates a great time death for an early settlement on the island, so as to make Taiwan the prime candidate for Austronesian homeland and the center of Austronesian dispersal. This is something that we also have touched upon last time. We said they must have been here a long time ago, and they have settled in Taiwan before they uh, migrate out of Taiwan. And this great diversity of Formosan languages, we can see from the examples of numbers in these languages. So these Formosan languages, they will use a decimal system just like uh, what we are used to now, or a modified decimal system. And we will explain what it means by a modified decimal system. Uh, is there anyone in this room that is not using a decimal system when you count? Anyone from the Great Britain? You are still using that? De oh, no. oh. He's not here, right? OK. The one from the Great Britain is not here. I, I'm just talking about uh, the Great Britain. For example, uh, they use 12, right? 12 inches, but unlike the American system. So probably that's the only one that I know. But in the Formosan languages, uh, decimal system is used. But in a particular plain tribe called Faze, uh, a kinary system is used. What does it mean? For example, the number 6 to 9, they are expressed. For example, number 6 is 5 plus 1. Number 7 is 5 plus 2. And 5 plus 3 is 8. And 9 will be 5 plus 4. Okay, So this is totally different from what you could possibly think of. Probably you have known some languages that are using this system as well. And in another clan tribe called Saixia, that's in the um, Miaoli area, uh, in the, uh, what is that, the northern, south of Taipei, but north of, uh, uh, north of Taizong, the middle part. Uh, in this particular tribe, they have a very unique way to say seven. They express seven as six plus one. And this is the only example among all the Formosan languages that have this very strange expression. And in the Atayalic tribes, Atayalic languages such as the ones in Ulai or the one in uh, Xinzhu, Jianshi, etc., and also the Dao. Remember, this was the one in the Sun Moon Lake. And I told you several years ago, we still have one uh, informant you know, capable, uh, older informant available, but you know, he passed away a few <laughs> years ago. And this was the one who couldn't even pronounce correctly the F sound because of the labial dental thing. He, does, he has lost all his teeth, so he was not able to pronounce correctly the F sound. And in these Atayalic languages, they have this strange expression for six and eight, 
they are making it into like two times three. Three times uh, two, two times three equals to six, and two times four for eight. And this same practice was followed by Sanxia and Western plain languages. So eight in these languages are expressed as two times four. So you can see Sanxia is very unique. There must be some borrowing or some influencing from other languages, but we don't know why. Only in Sanxia, seven is so unique as six plus one. So how to say numbers becomes quite interesting because you might want to see how these numbers are expressed in the Formosan languages. All sorts of numeral systems in the entire Austronesian language families are found in Formosan languages. As we said, there are altogether 10 branches and 9 is in Taiwan. So whatever system they are using to count, you can all find it in the Formosan languages, even though they cannot be found in other areas. Okay, such as the Saisha 7. So even though there are only a small number of languages on this island, there are only nine major tribes, and now we claim there are 42 uh, dialects, right, or 43. And this, as you can see, like uh, 6 plus 1 or 5 plus 2, they are mainly done by addition. All multiplication, like 2 times 3, 2 times 4, and occasionally by subtraction. So in one particular language, number 9 is done as 10 minus 1. And again, we see Saisha belongs to this group. And Dao, the Sun Moon Lake tribe, and also the Western Plain languages. The Western Plain is from um, like uh, Miao Li Xinzhu. OK, that, those are north of uh, Taizong and south of uh, Taipei. And new, the number 20 in Saisha, again, it's very unique. It's derived from the word a person. OK, the word a person. That is 10 fingers and 10 toes. So they use the, the they derive from the word meaning a person for the number 20. And that's true because uh, I have some relatives living in Taidong, where Amis and Puyuma is. I was told that when um, my relative, when she worked long time ago in Taidong, they have to be dealing with the Formosan people uh, from n nearby. And when they count, they would use their hand. If the hands are not enough, they, they use their toe to count, you know, because, you know, I think uh, <laughs> Arithmetic probably is hard for them. And this was true, at least. Uh, the person is now in her 80s, so she worked when she was in her early 20s and late uh, teens. So this was like 60 years ago. That was still very common. But nowadays, um, education is quite common among these Formosan people, so <laughs> things are different now. So most Formosan languages distinguish between human and non-human numeral. This is probably something you are not familiar with. So they have different marking if the non, if the, uh, if you are talking about human versus non-human, and we, we would let you see what it means. The distinction is similar to that between personal and non-personal case marker as in many Formosan languages. So in Formosan language, a lot of them, they do have case marking. And the case is used before a noun to indicate uh, what case the noun is. For people who speak German, case should be quite what common, right? Case. case. For example, you have accusative case, dative case, right? Those are, those are called case. Case is something that can make your language kind of flexible in word order. Because of the case marking, you can change the word order without changing the meaning, because case will tell you whether this is an object, or this is a subject, or this is a direct object, or indirect object, etc. Uh, so uh, let me ask you, uh, is English a case marking language? Good, OK. Yeah. Only in personal pronouns. So for people who shook their head, you are right in a way, because uh, the English has lost most of the case marking 
system only in the pronoun like I, my, me, you, your, you. So it's in, only in the pronoun you still have the case marking. So I is the what? Nominative case, right? And my is a possessive case. Me is accusative case for direct object. So only in the case marking system uh, has English retained the marking system, uh, the case marking. But in German, Germ Germany, right? German, you have how many cases? Uh, four. No, more than that. More? I remember when I learned the article, the T-H-E, I have learned 16 different markings, case marking. Yeah, but you're only four cases, but uh, so many uh, different articles. There's four cases, three gender, four case. four. Okay, four so. Four cases 16. 16, right, okay. Say it again to the class. Four cases, three four. genders, and a referral. So it's Four, case, uh, four cases, three genders, and one for plural. So you have all together, I remember it was 16 yeah. uh, combination. So if you have to say the noun correctly, you have to know how to use these 16 cases. Yeah, uh, mostly you only can recognize case when you look at the article. Yes. Because, uh, so to say, the most word forms are the same, and they're distinguished by the article. Exactly, because the article tells you what case yeah. the noun is, so then you can know whether it's uh, how to interpret the sentence correctly. So in English, word order becomes very important. So you, if you say I hit Jiang, then oh I hit him, you cannot just you cannot reverse it. You cannot say oh let's use something I hit the I mean the girl hit the boy, and you cannot just reverse it. Say, uh, like the girl, the boy hit. Or oh, the girl, or oh, the the boy. Uh, what did I say? The. So in English you have. S V O. So the boy hit the girl, and the word order becomes fixed. You cannot just make, the girl, hit the boy. Then that, you will have a totally different meaning because. Girl and boy, you do not have the case marking system there. So word order become rigid and non-flexible, non unlike German or other case marking languages. In Formosan languages, most of the noun do have case marker in front. So the word order is, in a way, uh, flexible, unlike English or Chinese. Okay? So the human and non-human distinction is made not only in the numbers, but also for the terms that have to do with numbers, such as if you ask how many, how much, many, much, few, little, all these things related to numbers also are marked by human and non-human distinction. So some, for most languages, have the third set of numerals for cardinal, which we will see in a while, different from both human and non-human uh, numbers. So let's look at this human and non-human numerals. In Zhou, that's the tribe in Alisan, in Jiayi. For non-human nouns, they would have to be marked by a non-human case marker, Zoni. And for human noun, they use the human case marker, Jihi. Okay? So all these are the distinction for the languages regardless of whether they are the high mountain tribes or they are the plain tribes. Okay? Uh, I hope by now you probably can recognize some of them. For example, you have this Gavalang. Gavalang is in Yilan. Okay? And Tao, that's in Samun Lake. And Amis in Taitong, that's the first sinner. I mean, in Taitong, not the first sinner. The first sinner is Puyuma. Okay? Amis. And each human numeral forms is derived from the numeral system. So in Kanakanavu, that's in, uh, some are in Kaohsiung, okay? In Kaohsiung, that's in the south of Taiwan, south of Jiayi. And Tao and Amis, they would, done, they would do this human numeral by de deriving it from the numeral stem. For example, and they add this prefix of da. So they have the non-human set, and they have the numbers, and they just add this 
da prefix to make it as the case marking for the human numeral. And some would add the kin prefix as in gavalang. So you see this kin prefix over here to make it into a, a numeral markings for human noun. Some languages like Zhou, that's the Alisan tribe and the Gavalang, also use suppletive forms. What is suppletive form? Suppletive form is understood as the use of one word as an inflective form of another word when the two words are not cognates. So look at this. This is for non-human, Usik, and this is for human, which is totally different from, you know, its numeral system. So they would just find another form to supplement, to supply for what is missing here. That, that is what we call the sub suppletive form. Okay? So different tribes, different languages have different device, linguistic device, to make their human numeral form. And surprisingly, the human numerals in these languages are more marked. What does it mean by being marked? Mark is as, as opposed to default. Default is something that is unmarked. So whatever is taken for granted will be default. Mark is something distinctive, very unique, very uh, special. So these human numerals are more marked. That means the default form is the non-human one. And they would have to make something special to make them into human numeral. So, this is not the trend as we have seen in languages in the world, because languages in the world generally show a distinction in animacy higher in the hierarchy than a distinction of humanness. So most of the languages in the world, you will see a distinction between animate noun and non-animate noun, probably. But in this, for most languages, human is the most important factor to distinguish the noun or the nu numeral nouns. So for most language, and we try to figure out why is the reason behind. So the cognitive implications are there for the for most languages to be different in this regard. What could be the cognitive factors? And these are some speculation, but probably it's true. For most people in general consider human of great value in their daily life. Okay. So as as we have talked about. A lot of name for the tribe, for example, uh, Yami, that's one tribe. And Yami, the term in that language means human. And all these tribes has a name, for example, Sedik. Sedik, the meaning of this lexical item in the Sedik language is human. So you can see they place great emphasis and they uh, assign great value for humans. And probably this is why the human numerals are very important in, in these languages. And parents rarely beat their own children. Okay? Uh, this is a Formosan tradition. By the way, do you know in some of the Formosan tribe, they have very different culture. Do you know where they bury their ancestor? In some of the tribes. Can you guess? Hmm? In the backyard? No. No. Uh, in the first language that we have done field work on, we, we did the Sadiq language. And the ancestor, I think they use uh, Karmatian, right? Oh, okay. Uh, and then it's buried in their living room, right there. So like they can uh, think of their ancestor all the time. And this is different from a lot of practices in the Han people. And they believe in something called Gaga in the Sadiq language. That's their, like their, no, OK, don't. Yeah, at first when I came across that the term, I, I found it funny too. But it's a very sacred term for meaning the Holy Spirit of their ancestor. So they do a lot of things according to the guidance of their, their. It's actually, it's really pr written this way. No kidding. Yeah, in Sadiq. Okay. So this human and non-human numeral distinction uh, 
it's not only just in the noun, but it's also for the case marking, for the case marker. So for example, here you see a noun which is stone, that's non-human. And then, uh, then you have this marking on the numeral, la. But if you are talking about people, then you have the marking ba. So they use different prefix or different case marker to show uh, their numeral noun. Okay, so human and non-human refers to nouns like this. So this is a non-human because stone is not animate, it's non-human. Also in Amis, you can see, for example, in this case, you are talking about house. So you have a, a nominative marker go, but here children, you also assume the same nominal marker, but in the, in the numeral system, you are using different markers. For this, you would have the bar prefix, but for this one, when you are talking about houses, which is non-human, you don't have any marking. So the numeral for humans are more marked in the, in the sense that you would assign a different prefix to mark the noun. Okay, this is the, the meaning why numeral in uh, humans, they are more marked. And when we talk about the human and non-human numerals, we have like these two columns here. The human is more marked because you have a different prefix here. But the third set is for the cardinal. They also have another set for the number. So it's very complicated in these languages. And over here, I have just given you some of the languages that probably uh, we have talked about. In the reading, you have come across more languages because Dr. Lee has listed a whole range of languages that will show this kind of three-way distinction and also for the uh, human and non-human distinction. But the purpose is not for you to memorize the whole thing. The purpose is for you to see there's a different way of counting in the Formosan languages. And in a while, I hope I will let you see why it is so important that we want to know this different, unique way of counting uh, numbers. Okay, and we have also talked about the decimal and quinary system, right? So most, for most languages, keep the decimal system as has generally been reconstructed. So like so, this tribe we have talked about so much, where is it located? Where is the Zo tribe located at? Alisan, okay, thank you. Okay, that's the Alisan. Remember the tribe with beautiful women, okay? That's a Zhou tribe. So all these tribes are using the decimal system. So these numbers, probably for some of you who might be interested, you might want to memorize this. So Isa, Dusa, Deru, Seba, Lima, Enem, Bitu, Walu, Siwa, Bulu. Okay. Uh, my relatives told me when she worked with uh, Formosan people in Taitung, they would have to use these numbers a lot. So, you know, and these numbers, if you go to Philippines, I think they still understand when you use uh, this form to, to count. You know, they are using very similar system. Even the pronunciation is similar, probably only with minor uh, modification, but they are mutually intelligible, you know, with this system, especially Lima, okay, Lima, number five, it's very common in, uh, throughout all Austronesian, I mean, throughout all Formosan languages, including the one in the Philippines, okay? So this is something uh, we have just talked about. We, they use addition and multiplication apply much more frequently than subtraction because for subtraction we only see one single example which is number nine. They make it from 10 minus one. And 10, again, that's a, a reflection of the decimal system because uh, they are using 10 as a unit, minus one becomes nine. But that's very rare. Most of them are using uh, addition plus and multiplication, okay, uh, two times three, two times four. And but they, 
that's a, a plant tribe. It's quite unique in that it is the only Formosan language that almost has a kinary system except for Isid, for number 10. And that the number from 6 to 9 are all additive. That means to add. So Hasa, 5 is different from the widely attested form Lima. Remember I told you Lima is uh, across the board, but in this particular tribe, they have a different form for number five. That's why we single it out. Most of the Formosan languages will use Lima for number five. So for number six, they use five plus one. So they use this form, number five, and you have a change of the final vowel because of assimilation with the following vowel. So six is five plus one. And seven, they use five plus two, dusa. As you can see, that's number two. And you know this form, again, because they, it's followed by a vowel. So this uh, proto form of final P is assimilated into a voice vowel B. And number eight, dulu. Again, you see number three and number nine is five plus four, like this. Okay, so this is a way very different from what we can think of. And then we talk about the number seven in Saixia. That's the only language and the only case where numeral number seven is done by six plus one. Uh, in, in terms of numbers, why is seven considered lucky in English? Is it only because it's you have this expression lucky seven or why is seven a lucky number in English? Any guess? Dorothy. I don't know what I don't know if I don't know why, but that's why I thought it was like from the song machine. Okay. <laughs> Well, but it's like a chicken and egg question. I don't know. Because seven is lucky, that's why you have the seven in a row when you hit a jackpot. Or is it because you hit a jackpot with four seven or three seven, that's why seven is lucky. I don't know. So I just want, I'm just curious why seven would be considered lucky. Is, it, is seven a lucky number in Japanese? You use English lucky seven. Okay. Is seven a lucky number in Chinese? <laughs> what is the lucky number in Chinese? How, why? Fa. Okay. That's a harmony with the with the lexical item like prosper. Prosper. Yeah. Nine. Nine. Yeah. Uh, why? Uh, I heard it's because like heaven is number ten, and so nine is next to it, something like that. That's why uh, I think the Forbidden City has like nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine rooms or something like that. And so because <laughs> we do have an expression called uh, crown nine. This is nine, right? This is heaven, right? So it's like it's like similar to what you have just said. But I don't think nine is lucky in Chinese because of that. Medium, you want to say something? Yeah, because this pronunciation, nine, is jiu. Jiu means long. So usually, usually you will see this number. People will spend a lot of money, extra money, to buy a lucky number for their cell phone. Or they will buy for their license plate, right? Because they want lucky numbers there. So you either you see they end with number eight because they want to be prospering, right? Or they could have eight, nine. They want to prosper in for a long time. You know what I mean? Okay. So 
they will use all these harmonies again. You know, Chinese are using a lot of harmony, even with number. Uh, so they like this too. They prosper in two times and for a long time. Okay, so they would use this. Yeah. So you mean this is a male dominant society? No, because there's a term called yang zhou. Yang zhou. Okay. Yang zhou. So it's considered good? No, huh? it is the last uh, masculine number. So it is considered as the climax. Climax. Uh, later it will drop. Oh, it will drop. Okay, so this is like the best, best of everything. Okay, I have never heard about this, but this is something interesting because every every time you will learn something different. And uh, for those people who speak Cantonese, what is the lucky number for you? We have quite a few people who, uh, who can speak Cantonese. Eight. Also eight? But don't you use this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, do you know what, what is it? Can you pronounce this in Cantonese? So it's the same as Ilufa? Is it all similar? Very similar, but not exactly the same, right? Okay, this is for E. And of course, this is Leo, but they, they try to, in Cantonese, it's similar like to Okay, you see? All the way. Prospering all the way. Okay, so they, they for Cantonese people they usually like this number. One six eight. Any other sup uh wow. Well, is this superstition? Okay, any other superstition uh, with numbers in different cultures? I'm sure you would have this in your discussion questions, so you would have a lot to talk about. But I just want to know if there are any special cases with numbers in the language that you are familiar with. What, what is that? I is it good or bad? Bad. Yeah. bad. Oh. oh, this is bad. Oh, but you know, six, six is good number in Chinese. You know why? Why is that? Do you know? Biblical. Oh, okay, from the Bible. Okay. But everybody believes in that, even if you are not Christian. I don't yeah. think serious. <laughs> no, you don't think of it. It's there. It's there. Okay. But in Chinese, six six, because we have expression, what? Liu liu what? Liu liu da sun. Yeah, that's right. So we have this. This is six. Liu liu. Okay, which means you have two six, right? Da is big, right? Sun is smooth, so smooth all the way. Smooth all the way. So you see all this kind of, uh, let's call it superstition, has a lot to do with the language there, right? So uh, you consider seven lucky, like in Japanese case, because they take it from English, so you think it's lucky seven, right? And that's why you have seven up. I think that's why, 
the, the drink is called seven up. And we have talked about up, we say up is good, right? And I think seven probably has to do with being lucky. Okay? Uh, so you would not consider any drink called eight down or whatever. You know, it has to be seven up. Okay. So the and in Saisha it's the same way. They have this unique case about seven, um, which we don't know why, because this is the only case. And this is a way to say it in Saisha. A he is number one and this is six plus one is seven. So this example is very unique, not only to Formosan languages, but also to extra Formosan languages, because the, uh, we cannot find other examples across uh, the Formosan languages or outside of the Formosan language with such unique way of expressing numbers. Uh, instead of uh, continuing with what I have just said, let me just show you first this map so that you know where these tribes are. Again, just in case you don't know what we are talking about. I'll just show you the major tribes, the night tribes. Okay, this is where Taipei City is. This is where you are, right? This is Taiwan. And you see this Ataya, Ataya tribe. There's one major tribe. It's over here uh, in the Taoyuan area and also all the way to probably uh, further down. Uh, you see this Setik? That's the the tribe with the movie, now now they have made a famous movie of this Sadiq tribe, right? Sadiqa Balai, Balai, the, the movie that we have talked about. So two major tribes here. You have seen Amis, that's in Taitung, right? Amis. Uh, that's, that's the tribe with the most population of the Formosan uh, people in Taiwan. That's Puyuma, that's where the first famous singer is from, uh, only a very small tribe, you know, not, not many speakers and not many populations here, also in Taitung. You see this Lukai, Lukai is in Pindong area, and Lukai is the only language in, among all the Formosan languages that has only two case marking system. Most of the other language, the other tribes, they have a case mark, they have a, um, well, I probably I should not say case mark, uh, focus system, okay, focus, some people call it case, some people call it focus, but Luca is the only one with two focuses, the other one all have four focuses, so for every verb in these languages, they have to differentiate whether it's agent focus, whether the verb is related to the agent, the doer of the action, or it's patient focused, re refer to the person who is receiving the action, locative focus, referring to the place where the action takes place, or it's a mm, re reference focus, referring to like instrumental and also benefactive, goal, etc. So in the other tribe, they all have four focus system. Uh, but a uh, focus system of four types. Only the Rukai has two, two types for their focuses. And then over here, you will see the Zhou, that's the Alisan mountain, uh, where the Zhou people is located at. And over here you have Tao, that's uh, where Samun Lake is, right? The Samun Lake is right here, and that's, it's almost extinct now. I think we don't have, uh, competent native speaker for this tribe. And over here you see Bunun, Bunun. Okay, Bunun is where you have the APA harmony, right? That's where the tribe is. It's over here, they have a major tribe. So the Zhou and the Bunun actually, they have a lot of mixed marriages, but you know, the Zhou people and the Bunun people would like to maintain their identity. So usually they don't want to say, their language has become, in, you know, in a way, in some of the places they have become so similar, especially the Beizhou, the northern part of the, uh, I mean the Nanzhou, the southern part of the Zhou language is quite similar with uh, part of the Bunun languages here. So over here you have A major tribe and over here you have Yame, that's the Orchid Island and you have the Nice tribe. So these are the Nice tribes of the Formosan people here in Taiwan.
So at least you get a relative uh, location of where these tribes are and where they are located relative to uh, Taiwan. No. So we have seen this unique case of number seven in Sai Xia. And then we want to see also something that's unique to Formosan language because uh, according to Dr. Lee, you don't see this kind of uh, uh, method to express numbers in other languages. So like number six is two times three. So like in the Thao, that's in the Samun Lake. And also uh, Sai Xia, that's the one with very unique seven. Uh, you have different way of talking about number six. So you have like two times three. Ga is the two prefix. And Dulu, as you remember, that's number three. So that's the way to say number six. And number eight, again, you have this two marker followed by a four. So two, four equals to eight. So, so Tao and Sai Xia employ the same prefix Ga, meaning two times which may have been borrowed from one language to another at an earlier stage. Okay, the Tao is in the Samun Lake in the central part and Sai Xia is in the Xinzhu, uh, Miaoli area. So probably they have borrowed from each other. And these multiplicative numbers in various Formosan languages does appear to be an area feature which may have begun with number eight first. So uh, according to the uh, Robert Blass, that's another uh, scholar we have uh, used his material last time. He said probably all these kind of devices you, m making uh, two times three, two times four, derive from number eight first. So, and then spread to number six. But numerous system in uh, Formosan language in different, for example, these tribes, this is the High Mountain Tribe Tao again, and Sai Xia again, and Atayalik. These are the High Mountain Tribes, but Sai Xia is the Plain Tribe. And Bazik is the one with a unique kinary system. So all these different way of saying one to 10. In Bazik, you have one to five, just like what we have. And then for number six, you have five plus one, five plus two, etc. because this is the only kinary uh, system with numbers. And the Sai Xia has a unique seven, six plus one, unique eight, two, two times four, and nine is 10 minus one, etc. Okay, and thou is similar. And how about numbers larger than 10? Okay, uh, 11 to 19, like Chinese in all Formosan languages, 11 to 19 are formed by addition, namely 10 plus one, 10 plus two, etc. But 20 to 90 are formed by multiplication because you know uh, addition will be too difficult. Multiplication indicated by the discontinuous morpheme ma followed by uh, the numbers at the end in most languages. Namely, 20 will be 2 times 10 and 30 will be 3 times 10. 3 times 10, okay? And so 20 in Sai Xia, the right, remember the, the famous example about 20 in Sai Xia? It's derived from the number, uh, uh, derived from the lexical item meaning person. So you see here, this is the lexical item for person. So they just derive based on this into a lexical item for 20. So they make it into this way. And the guessing was because a person has 10 fingers plus 10 toes, so that's why they use uh, 20 this way, deriving from the lexical item, person. And 21 to 29 are all formed by multiplication before addition. So for example, in so 21, you first do the multiplication 2 times 10 and plus 1. So first multiplication, then addition. And pi 1, that's the one in the uh, in the south, uh, you have dusa. Remember, that's two, so two times ten plus one, like this. And why are we learning all so much about numbers? What does number have to do with uh, the Formosan language? And what is number so important? I just talked to Ellen because 
she happened to write a report last time about uh, the connection between numbers and arithmetic, right? Okay, so do you want to share what you have written with us? Okay, and actually, it's a theory by a scholar, right? What kind of method has he done to verify his guessing? MRI. MRI, yeah. So this is a kind of new research direction. They are trying to combine linguistic study with uh, medicine, like the FMI, the functional magnetic resonance image, something like that. So uh, they could monitor wh which part of the brain is activated when you are doing some kind of activities. Usually language part is said to be related to your left hemisphere, left hemisphere of your brain. And math usually is related to the right hemisphere of your brain. So in that study, did they say which part of the brain is used? Okay, so this is something that you, you might want to consider because you know a lot of times we do a study, you probably don't just want to limit your study to the field you are familiar with. There are other methods, tools, that could help you to verify what you want to say. And you know, brain is uh, special in the sense that, uh, what is that word? Uh, like lateralization of the brain. Your brain is divided into the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, and each hemisphere is usually reserved for a particular function. So people say if you are an artist, probably you, know, you, have, you, have, you make better use of your right hemisphere. But if you are good with language or logic, probably you make better use of your left hemisphere. And this is verified by, now we have the technique called fMRI. So you can see which part of your brain, you know, receive the most action and is activated by uh, whatever input that you have given to your uh, activities. Um, I don't know how you think about the theory is it true that Chinese people, Korean people, or J Japanese people are better with the number because they have a different way of expressing numbers in their language? Mm. You can have a good discussion later on. You know, probably would, this will prompt you into thinking about the problem. And I know a lot of people in this room, you are multilingual. So you are very good with your languages. and. I'm just curious, for those of you who are good at language, are you also good at math? <laughs> Alex. I'm just curious because in the States, we're taught to use calculators in the language. So, like, I don't know about the language thing, but just if I have a calculator, I'm going to use the calculator. I don't know if it's, I think we learn more complicated math, but at that expense, we we are not as good at practical math. So for example, like counting chains for me is kind of difficult. Whereas yeah. like I can use a calculator for more like advanced stuff. So we're just taught to use a calculator. From grade school? From like middle school, I've been using From middle school. So I know I'm like the only really good at math. So yeah, <laughs> we 
We even have cram school to teach you how to calculate without using yeah. calculator. Then you have an uh, imaginary abacus in your brain. Yeah. So you're doing all this addition, subtraction, and everything. And uh, you can see children, young children, maybe fourth grade, third grade, or even younger. You know, you give them long numbers for addition, subtraction, and they just do this, you know, like imaginary abacus, and they come up with the right answer. And when my daughter was uh, taking a summer school in the States uh, for the SAT exam, right? And they give, they give you English as well as math. And for the math, they ask you to prepare calcula you know, calculator. My daughter didn't have calculator, so she borrowed a toy calculator with this bright blue, yellow, and red color. You know, you know those calculators for the kids? And you know, she borrowed that from her cousin, and she went to the school. But you know, because she was educated in Taiwan all the time, so she's good with numbers. And the teacher, at the end of the session, it was a summer session, the teacher said, oh, this person with this ghetto calculator could do so well. <laughs> That's exactly the word. <laughs> That's exactly what the teacher was said to. But it was meant as a compliment, so I said, okay, take it, <laughs> take it in a good sense, you know. Uh, so maybe it has to do with how you train your brain to be familiar with certain activities, right? Also, kind of like set up for failure. Like, <laughs> you shouldn't give like a kid a calculator. You're not going to learn. Like even if you teach them how to do it, they're just going to be less likely. Yeah, but probably we should reserve our brain for something else. Yeah, yeah you know, we can make better use. Marlene, you were going to say uh, something. Actually, um, we were watching Ted Beard during math class until after his grade. Not allowed after eight, 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 eight. Not allowed until eighth grade. Yeah, like without the grade, we weren't allowed to use our calculators during math and things like that. To be honest, we were not going to stop it. Yeah, like Okay, how about in uh, Southeast Asia and how about in Canada? The same? Canada. <laughs> where, where are people? We have people from Canada. <laughs> where? <laughs> Madan, are you good at math? You, no. no? I grew up in Israel, not Canada. <laughs> I know, Israel. How is that? How, uh, how was the education like? Well, when I compare to my friends in Canada, uh, we, we did math to, uh, we were at a higher level when we were younger. I fell behind because of that really quickly. So. Mm. so I don't know which way is better. Should we try and to use a lot of our calculation ability or we should just count down calculator? That's really, Sam, where are you from? Huh? America. You're from America, okay. And anyone in this room that is good at math? <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Dorothy, tell us. <laughs> Why? Why are you good at? Is it because of your education at home? Alex. Uh, I think that's also a very subjective question because like, I, I, mean, I thought I was good at math until I got into college. <laughs> and so, like, math is a lot harder than what you learn. You know, like, there's some really crazy stuff. Not, like, not even numbers anymore. Like, so, so. Marlene, you also raised your hand. Yeah. Um, well, I calculus. Calculus. You like calculus. No. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, okay, that's a subjective question, I agree, but, you know, uh, you probably want to think more in terms of why 
you will have this feeling for numbers. And some people just don't have feelings for number at all, you know. And I don't know. I I'm very good at numbers for some reason. And I, I have always thought that probably has to do with my left hemisphere. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, language but and math. It's a large couple. You can say the same thing about music and, you know. Music I, I did choir and violin lessons and everything, and I'm still not good at math. So <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I think that that's a, you know, a thing that people don't realize that they don't have to have studies say. It's one of those things where it's like, you know, studies say that if you so probably we need a lot more research to find out yeah, because I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. I'm just telling you, numbers is really the last thing that you you can test yourself in terms of how good you are in in that language. I truly believe in that. I think you know if you can think of numbers in that target language, then probably you have mastered that language well. Try try to test yourself because you know I have done um, experiment with students, ask them to tell me about numbers and without thinking. And if you still have to think in another language, probably it's, you have not yet totally internalized that language system. Okay, so think of that. Now let's go to the number nine. The only language, uh, there are only three languages. Three plain languages, they talk about nine by what? Subtraction, actually. Okay? So the three morphemes in each of the numerous stems for the nine are de derived from one followed by a genitive marker followed by that. So it's actually one from that, so namely 10 minus 1. So it's like 1 from that, then being 10. So 9 is formed by 10 minus 1. So these are the only three languages they have found uh, in both blood studies and also Dr. Lee's study. So what do numbers tell us? Numbers in these Formosan languages tell it actually preserve the features of the Proto-Austronesian languages. So when you want to reconstruct a Proto-Austronesian language, these numbers give you clue because you can compare their uh, form in order to reconstruct a proto-form of the language. And for most languages preserve the most features of the Proto-Austronesian languages, many of which cannot be found in Austronesian languages spoken in other areas meaning you can only find it in Taiwan because nine tribes out of the ten major branches for the Proto-Austronesian languages, you can find them in Taiwan. And in numbers, they have actually shown these special features and you cannot even find some of them in languages outside of Taiwan. So two in Formosan languages is Dusa that we have just shown you, or Rosa. This is like a retroflex S, Rosha, in which the sound S or Sha is preserved. It became Dua in other Austronesian languages. So you see this Dusa becomes Dua. So the S sound is lost. And four in Formosan languages is Sepa or Shepa. And in other Austronesian languages, the initial S sound or the initial retroflex sound is drop, so it becomes epa. So whose onset fricative, meaning this s or sh, has been dropped? So by studying these languages, at least you can see this s and sha should be there in the proto form. That's why languages have become so important. And seven in all Austronesian languages is bitu. Okay. So only 14 of the Formosan languages are still al al alive. That's why you know the Ministry of Education now make Formosan languages in Taiwan. Uh, the official number is, num is 14. Okay. Most of the plain languages are extinct. So plain languages, the Saisha is a plain language, but it's still uh, you can still find speakers the Saisha, but most of them are not, not no longer no longer. Existing. And nowadays only Thao 
in Gavalang are still spoken by some senior speakers, but uh, and there's no Baze speaker as of now. So in 2011, the Baze, uh, or even the South speaker, I think you can hardly find a competent speaker. Only very few people, less than 10 in the mountain areas of Kaohsiung can speak Kanakanavu. Kanakanavu is uh, uh, a, a dialect of the uh, Thao language, uh, I mean of the Zhou language. The preservation of Saisha is far from ideal either because the Saisha is very close to the Hakka villages. So in the Saisha language, they have a lot of borrowing uh, from the Hakka languages and, and their syntax is totally affected by the Mandarin syntax. So instead of uh, V initial languages in the Saisha, a lot of them are just like Mandarin SVO, okay, the word order. And every language has its own structure system and present a particular knowledge system. Losing any one of them, especially for any of the Formosan languages to become extinct, is a loss that cannot be compensated in any way. Okay, for reconstruction reason, or for understanding uh, proto-Austronesian languages, we do need to look at this number seriously. So in the last part of today's class, I just want to uh, share with you some of the disposed dispersal and expansion path of these Formosan languages. We come back to the same question, why we want to investigate this Formosan language, because we want to explore the wonder in these languages, and to reconstruct the history of the dispersal and expansion of the Formosan aborigines in Taiwan, if the relationship between different Formosan languages can be clarified. Because we want to reconstruct the history, how they mi uh, migrate, how, how they move out of Taiwan, and how they are uh, dispersed and expanded into other areas in the world. And to also to establish the path of how the Formosan aborigines in Taiwan dispersed and expanded in the past 5,000 years. Okay. And we do this mainly by linguistic evidence because this is the main, res main sources to re rely on. Even though we also have other sources such as archaeology, or, or you know, like 10 years ago we tried to do with genetic evidence. But right now, most of the reconstruction is still depending on the linguistic evidence that we have come across. And now, let's talk about the dispersal. The dispersal of this ancient Formosan aborigine should be at the southwestern plain, namely the Jianan Pinyin. That's the Jiayi and Tainan, I'll show you. Because greatest diversity is found in the Formosan language spoken in the central and the southern part of Taiwan. So this is the map again. Jianan Pinyin is in this area. This is the area, can you see? Okay, and then probably spread out from here. So look at this map, and w let's look at some fact also from the map. Okay, most of the people agree that the proto Austronesians started to disperse and expand around 5,000 years ago. The first split was the Rukai tribe, the Rukai, was the one with the two-focus uh, two system here. Okay, this is Rukai. Which dispersed to the mountain area in the southeast. So this Rukai dispersed to the southeast. That's the first spread. The second split was the Zhou group. The Zhou is over here. This is the Zhou, where the Alisa mountain is located at. And the second blade was the Zhou group to the mountain area in the northeast. So here, go to the northeast, this direction. The third split is after 1,000 years ago. Remember we talked about last time there's a 1,000 years gap in between. So the first time when you have the Rukai, that's about 5,000 years ago. And then so now, with these two split, after 1,000 years, the third split began 
and it was into three dire directions. One to the north, to the Atayali group here, or Saisha over here, and Baze, and to the Western Plain tribe. So this is a Western Plain tribe. Another to the south goes to Paiwan and Puyuma. Puyuma, uh, remember we see this? And the Paiwan here. Okay, so three directions. One goes to the Plain tribes here, and the other one goes to the Puyuma and the Paiwan. And the third one is going to the northeast to Bunun. So northeast to Bunun, to this area. Okay, so that's the third split. And then there's another one, around 3,500 years ago, the fourth split was from the southwestern plain to the east. So southwestern plain is here to the east. So you see, going to the Amis, Gavalang, that's in the Yilan area, and to the Bazet, somewhere here, and also to Silaria and further expanded to the greater Taipei region around 2,000 years ago and to the Yilan Plain about 1,000 years ago. Okay, so to Taipei and here. So in Taipei, if you go to Wulai, you could still see some Atayali tribe. Okay. As for Yami over here, this is an Austronesian language spoken on the Orchid Island and it's genetically rather distinct from Formosan language spoken in Taiwan but close to the Austronesian language spoken on Batang Island, the Philippines. So if you speak Yami, they are mutually intelligible with the people uh, you come across in the Philippines. And it's starting to move from the Batang to the Orchid Island around 700 years ago. Okay, so these are some of the facts that uh, this map is trying to show us. And we were hoping that there would be written documentation for verification, but there was virtually no written record in Taiwan until 400 years ago for this Formosan tribe. And the stage of dispersal are actually inferred from linguistic evidence, ethnological evidence, and also archeological evidence, and various other information such as the oral history of the narratives and written documents in Dutch, Chinese, and Japanese. You know about Dutch because in the 17th century, they came to Taiwan, right? And uh, Chinese, because of the Qin Dynasty, they may have some record. And mainly, a lot of references on this Formosan languages are done by Japanese scholars during the Japanese occupation of Taiwan. So we still have to consult a lot of the, the readings in Japanese if, if they are not translated. And because of their work, we are able to find some uh, written documents in order to reconstruct this history. So now let's look at, lastly, let's look at the stages of the dispersal. Okay, again, let's go back to the map. Okay, and I'll just show you from this map. The dispersal started 400 years ago because that's when we have the written documents, right? The Paiwan tribe dispersed from the Da Wu mountain to the south and to the east. So where's the Paiwan tribe? The Paiwan tribe is here. And they are dispersed to the south of the Dao mountain and to the east. So south here and east here. And the mountain is right over here. That's the Paiwan. That's 400 years ago. After 100 years, in 300 years ago, the Bunun tribe dispersed from Nantou to the south and to the east. Okay. Bunun is here. Actually, they occupy a large area, and this is the central of Taiwan, the Nantou province. So they, they the, the balloon dispersed to the south and to the east again. Okay, what's interesting is that their, their dispersal is always to the south and to the east. The third stage is 
at 250 years ago, the Athayalik group dispersed from Nanto to the north and to the east. Okay. Here. Now it's different because now it's in the northern part. So it's dispersed to the east and to the north. And then about 100 years ago, the Western Plain tribe moved to Ilan Plain. Okay. The Western Plain tribe refers to all these tribes. They moved to the Ilan Plain. It's over here. Ilan is in the east of Taiwan. So that's the four stages of dispersal. It's um, proven by the written documents available, written by the Dutch, the Chinese, and also the Japanese people. So mainly, this tell us different kinds of uh, facts about this uh, Aboriginal people. First, their expansion, their disposal, whether it's documented or supported by written document. So, but at least with the written documents, you can be sure about these last 400 years in terms of their movement in the Taiwan island. And before that, you would just have to count on different kind of evidences that you can find, including ethnological, archaeological, and linguistic evidence.